My guest today believes that we have a right to live in a healthy environment and that our air, water, food, and consumer products should be free of dangerous and untested industrial chemicals. Michael Green, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Michael Green is executive director of the Center for Environmental Health, or CEH, which helps to raise public awareness about the corporate use of toxic chemicals and provide solutions to protect our health. Michael has pioneered the groundbreaking legal work that has won landmark victories to protect the public from hazardous consumer products and toxic emissions. Michael has worked in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Environmental Management and the EPA's Working Group on Environmental Equity. He was awarded the California Wellness Foundation's Annual Leadership Award as well as the prestigious Compassion in Action Award from the Dalai Lama Foundation and the Committee of 100 for Tibet. I'm so glad you're here today. We have so many, so many things to talk about. Um, so, you know, there's... As I said, there's tons of toxins in, in our environment, and especially inside our own homes, that can make us sick. And can you give our listeners a sense of what some of the most important toxins to be aware of? Sure. You know, we're, we're doing an unplanned science experiment upon ourselves today. That's just the nature of the, the world we live in today. Mm -hmm. So there are 80,000 chemicals, 80,000 chemicals in the chain of commerce today. And close to 1,000 new ones are brought in each year. Amazing. And all of, all of these chemicals, except the ones that are in food or drugs, are assumed to be safe unless the government proves them unsafe. And it's very difficult for the government to do that. So what we have is this, this literally a stew of different chemicals that we're using, very few of which have been tested, and almost none of which have been tested adequately for safety. Some of those are ones that you just talked about. So the flame retardants in foam furniture, for example, or bisphenol A, which is a chemical that's in uh, canned foods and uh, decreasingly in plastic bottles. And then there's, of course, heavy metals, lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic. And these metals also are very serious health hazards, especially to children. Now, these, these, these metals... Right, these metals are in kids' jewelry. That, that and from Claire's, I know that there was a study done that you know Claire's is this popular store. My daughter buys jewelry there. It was really kind of disheartened to hear that they have such high levels of lead. And so, tell us why is this such a concern? About at the Center for Environmental Health, over a decade ago, we decided we were going to have to do something about lead in all of the different children's products. So we started testing them systematically. Every product designed for use by or on or uh, near a child. So we started with diaper rash medications, and we found lots of lead in that. And mm -hmm. that's crazy if you think about it. If there's a product that you don't want lead in, it's one designed to be put on the broken skin of a newborn. Unbelievable. And, and, and the reason in that case, the reason was, was that the active ingredient, zinc, was sometimes, they sometimes used unrefined zinc that was contaminated with lead, mm -hmm. sometimes very high levels. So lots of times it's not intentionally added. In fact, almost always it's not intentionally added. But there's some reason that the companies are not paying enough attention to it. And so now in the case of uh, children's jewelry, what we found was almost all of the jewelry manufacturers at some level had a problem with lead. And now more recently we've discovered cadmium in the jewelry because of globalization. They don't make their own jewelry anymore. They just buy it from somebody maybe in China or maybe in Bangladesh, and they don't control actually the manufacturing process. So even if they, their contract says no lead in the jewelry, they don't necessarily know that that's the case. And so these companies need to take more responsibility for what they sell. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, and is there a way for us to? And I know there's these little lead test kits. So is that something that people should go ahead and now go ahead and test all their kids' jewelry? You could do that. So those lead test kits, which we have on our website, uh, information on how to get a couple different kinds of them. Um, you know, in a hard, but you can go to a hardware store and usually find them. They're actually made originally for testing for lead in paint. What it's a very rough instrument. It's, it's, you know, it's very simple to use, and it's, but it, it doesn't tell you how much lead, and it's not super accurate. But if the swab turns bright pink, you know to throw it away. 
so the jewelry away. So, so the, the lead will actually leach into our systems? I mean, if you're wearing, like, let's just say, for example, a necklace, I mean, is, is it that the child would have to chew on it, suck on it, or is it just resting next to your skin that presents a hazard? There's three routes of exposure that concern us. The one that concerns us by far the least is the one you just asked about, and that's through the skin. We're not really that worried about that exposure, but the other two are serious exposures, especially for children. One is hand-to-mouth exposure. So if your child touches it and then puts their hand in their mouth, then they are going, the lead will come off on their, you know, uh, on their fingers and go right into their mouth. The third is if if, and if, you're any, if your child is anything like my three-year-old son or my one-year-old daughter, everything ends up in their mouth. Mm-hmm. And so that's the, the most serious uh, route of exposure. So all three are important, but the most ex- important is when something ends up in their mouth. I see. If you're just joining us, I'm Beth Greer, and I'm speaking with Michael Green, Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Health on your supernatural life here on Green 960. Now, there's also... I've been reading about lead in baby bibs and purses and and toys. And so tell us a little bit about that. What, how does that show up? Sure. So uh, that was part of that same systematic testing of every product that is designed for use by children. And so what we found is we found the lead in candy imported from Mexico, and we found lead in uh, children's jewelry, and we found it in all these different things. And so during that time, we also found it in baby bibs, and all of these products now we have and toys. All of these products now have the companies are actively trying to eliminate the lead from them. The question is, can they be in control of their supply chain? When we first started working on this, we weren't. It, it was unusual. What Our, the response was? What lead in toys or lead in diaper rash medications? That's that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. By the time there was a tsunami of media and policy around it two and a half, three years ago, by the time I testified on Capitol Hill about it, everybody knew about the problem. The companies were very worried about their reputation and their brand, so they were starting to try to address the problems. So the actual real issue today is less about companies not caring about it because they care about their brand and reputation for sure, and more about their the, the question of whether they can, can are, in, are in charge of what they're actually selling, whether they know what they're selling. Right. Now, you CEH offers some free toy testing in San Francisco. Is that still going on? Yes, yes. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, someone can come to our office in the afternoons and we'll uh, test their toys or their other children's products. And that's one option. And then also nationally, people can send us something in but they should talk to us first because, so that we avoid having a tsunami of stuff mailed to us. They should just go onto our website and, and figure out what we'll take and how much and all of that from, from, from people who are actually mailing them in. Now, I think it's important for people to understand that when we're talking about lead in toys, for example, we're not just talking about metal toys. They're, they're in teddy bears, things like that, right? Oh, sure, because lots of times the source of the, of the lead is some kind of plastic. So especially if there's PVC, PVC is a junk plastic, and it has all kinds of different constituents in there. It has chlorine. It has sometimes chemicals called phthalates, which are designed to soften the plastic, but also have serious health impacts. And then sometimes there's heavy metals like lead or cadmium in there for other reasons, to give it a bright color or to hold all those different constituents together. So, Michael, let's talk a little bit about pesticides. Uh, scientists are saying now that even small doses of pesticides can damage our health, especially in unborn babies and small children. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. First of all, think about what a pesticide is. A pesticide is something designed to kill. It's either designed to kill an insect or it's designed to kill a rodent or it's designed to kill something that we don't like. But the thing is that something that is designed to kill some other living being has some poisonous effect that potentially is poisonous to us as well. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that when we think about sort of the green revolution kind of, you know, new crops that grow with less water or something like that, that's the story about genetically modified organisms, you know, genetically engineered crops. But most often, over 80% of the genetically engineered crops, the genetic engineering is designed to help the plant withstand more doses of pesticides. 
So we're designing crops that can withstand the pesticides, and they won't die, and it'll kill everything else around it. But then those pesticides are on the crops that we eat. And, and, and the they're also, in, actually, they're also inside the crops. So like some of the, the things like strawberries, for example, you can't wash the pesticide off. It's in the flesh. Right, right. So if it is a fumigant, like the methyl bromide that is used on strawberries, then that's, that, that's even an even bigger problem for a consumer. So 